it was a bit of a potpourri. I just don't know how to transition between some of these topics. So um, uh, part of why I was asked to come today, uh, to come to the conference was to talk about um, what I do around advocacy. So um, I'm going to forewarn you that there may be some triggers in this next part of the conversation. Um, a lot of it is my personal story and my personal family story. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of give that disclosure if people don't, uh, if, it, if people find it triggering, um, I, please feel free to mute me. I will not be offended or to exit for the next half an hour or so um, if, if, uh, if it seems like that would be best for, for you. So why do I do what I do? It's really hard to answer that question. There's a lot of really great reasons that would kind of fit nicely with my life story, but you know, none of them are really accurate. I'm, I'm kind of an addiction doctor by accident. If someone had told me 15 or 20 years ago when I kind of started down the path of becoming a physician that I'd be here today discussing my passion for the underserved addiction medicine population, I would have thought they were crazy. Um, like every other kind of 20 year old, I had the plan and somehow the plan didn't go exactly the way I wanted. I'd like to say today that I'm on plan B or C, but I think I'm on like plan Q or Z. I don't know. I might be on plan like double, you know, triple A at this point. Um, and uh, life just kind of has a way of doing that to all of us. Um, and so I'm going to go back to when I was seven years old. And my grandfather asked me if I wanted to be a lawyer like my father. And I, it's like, it's like family lore now, right? Um, I apparently stopped what I was doing. I have no recollection of this event, but my 91 year old grandfather does. Um, and looked at, looked at him and said, I had already committed myself to being a doctor. And I couldn't possibly change because I was seven years old and that decision had been made. And so I kind of grew up with, I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a doctor. This is what I want to do. Um, and I ended up going into internal medicine kind of by default. I have alopecia, as, as you guys saw yesterday, and I lost my hair when I was five years old, and I thought I wanted to be a dermatologist, and then I did a rotation in dermatology, and I hated it, and I was like, I, I don't want to do that, and I left the rotation with a letter from one of the top two hair researchers in the United States that ended with the line, we would love to have her as a resident here at her institution. And she had shared the letter with me, even though you're not supposed to share your letters with medical students for the match, right? Um, and I went back, to my, went back to my medical school and I said, well, that's really great, but uh, I don't wanna do dermatology, so I need to drop out of the match. So I dropped out of the match, so I'm a match dropout. Um, and I did a transitional year because one of my advisors said, you can't have no job when you finish medical school. That's not a good plan. So why don't you come to my institution where he was chair of internal medicine and do a transitional year? So I said, okay, I'll do a transitional year, figure out what I want to do. And I went through all the things I didn't want to do. I didn't want to be a surgeon because who likes the smell of burning flesh? I didn't want to be an OB because who likes the smell of amniotic fluid? I didn't want to do anything that was smelly. So I decided to go into internal. I also didn't want to work with children because I didn't have children at the time and sick kids were kids and parents and scariness um, to me. So I said, okay, by default, I'm going to go into internal medicine because I basically excluded everything else. And I guess I could, there's like kind of lots of branches of internal medicine and we'll go there. So I went into internal medicine, decided I liked it because of those longitudinal relationships. So it was going to be an outpatient primary care doctor. And then I went to my residency. I was fortunate to get a PGY2 spot. So I didn't have to repeat my internship. Yes. Um, and we had a buprenorphine clinic embedded in our residency clinic. This was so long ago that we actually called it the Suboxone Clinic. So we had a Suboxone Clinic in my residency. And I was the resident who kept getting assigned to it because I didn't whine about it. Like I didn't dislike the patients. I didn't love it, but I didn't dislike the patients. Um, and then I had kind of this typical residency experience where you where like, I was, I was in February of my final year of residency. I went in the room. It was 
obviously a person on buprenorphine and she had a positive urine drug screen, not confirmed. And I essentially said to her, maybe I like to think I didn't use these words exactly, but I'm pretty sure this is what the patient heard. You're a bad person because you clearly used a benzodiazepine. So now we're going to punish you by bringing you into the clinic more frequently, despite the fact that you're here with your three, like under 10 years old kids. And I still didn't have children of my own at that point. So I didn't really know what I was saying. And that's what we're going to do. And so I left the room and as a third year resident had, you know, within six months of graduation had like the worst thing that could possibly happen to you happen to me. My attending came in the room and he sat down on the trash can, on the lid of the trash can and he did something. And you probably guessed because it's on the slide that something was motivational interviewing. And we left the room and I was like, okay, like you did something because now the patient is totally agreeable to my fantastic plan, which went over like a ton of lead bricks, but like it went well for you. And so I, I want to know how you did that. And what he did was motivational interviewing. And he said, if you want to learn more about motivational interviewing, you should go to this conference in Boston. I went to this conference in Boston. And when I was there, I was talking about what I like about addiction. And I, um, one of the general, one of the, one of the physicians there said, Hey, you know, you should think about applying to our fellowship because we're starting this brand new fellowship. Um, and you know, you might, you might really enjoy it. So I came home from Boston and I said to my husband and, and I started talking to my, you know, I was excited about the conference. And a few months later, I was still talking about this conference and my husband um, who was in the commercial workforce at the time, he's no longer in the commercial workforce. He quit to take care of our children um, seven years ago when my daughter started having seizures. Um, and so he, uh, he said, you know, at the time he was VP of engineering for um, a company and they were venture backed in Boston and, uh, their engineering offices were where we lived in Ann Arbor at the time. And he said, you know, I can just like flip it. Cause at the time he was going to Boston for a week, a month for the business, you know, end of things. And he was in Ann Arbor for three weeks. He was like, I could just do the opposite. So we moved to Boston. Um, meanwhile, um, during my, I did a chief year while we while I was applying and in July of my chief year, um, my mother died of something called bronchiolitis obliterans obstructing pneumonia, um, a consequence of a historical suicide attempt. I started my fellowship 10 months later. Uh, I had the day that my mom died, my, my husband and I went to the reproductive endocrinologist because I'm also panhypopituitary, so it took some assistance to get pregnant. Went to the reproductive endocrinologist office and saw our son's heartbeat for the first time at 11 a.m. And my mom died at 1.15 p.m. that afternoon. Um, so 10 months later, I started, um, we moved to Boston. I started my fellowship. And, um, and in December of that year, my brother died. So that's my mom and that's my brother. Um, and he died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound secondary to his alcohol use disorder. And there was not a time and not a day that my brother was offered medication to treat his alcohol use disorder by a competent prescriber. I would talk to him and I would say, have you tried medication? Would you let me talk to your, to your treatment team? Can we, talk, can we get them into this? Um, a few, a few weeks after our mom died, he had moved from Michigan where we grew up and lived and where he, you know, our stepfather was, where he had friends and moved to St. Louis to start um, law school where he literally knew not a single person. Um, so he went into a self-imposed isolation. Unbeknownst to us, he dropped out of law school um, uh, after the first semester, he, I, he failed out of law school after the first semester, we found out after he died. Um, and he was living off of um, inheritance money that he had received from our, from our mom. We had convinced him to put some of the money into a trust uh, for, with my older brother and I controlling it, but some of the money went directly to him um, and he lived off of that. Um, and when the money was gone is when he killed himself. Um, so that, really changed kind of um, 
my perception and I've, uh, and uh, it turned kind of what was a professional thing that I did, a professional passion that I have um, and pivoted it into a fire and a light that, um, that didn't exist before. Um, I mentioned that I have adrenal insufficiency. Uh, I have panopopit, but one of the axes that doesn't work on me um, is uh, my adrenal gland. So I have adrenal insufficiency. Um, President Kennedy had adrenal insufficiency. And I love this picture because you can actually see the outlines of the moon faces that he had. Um, they actually gave him um, uh, uh, steroid uh, pellet injectables um, that had slow release. Um, but I always like to say that if President Kennedy could do it, um, I, I can do it. I can make sure that other families don't suffer the way that my family did. I, I tell people all the time, I won't be quiet until I know that we are treating people with substance use disorders um, with kindness and compassion. And as the days went by, and you know, when I talk about uh, the losses that I had, um, that, that I had in, in my 20s when my mom and my brother died, um, I tell people that each day keeps coming. It, it kept coming then and they keep coming now. And, and I'll never forget, I'll never relinquish that and, and it will never stop hurting. It doesn't consume me the way it once did. It just hurts differently. It's not better, it doesn't get better. But out of these losses and out of this turmoil, I grew my, I, I grew my purpose. I, I grew the strength to speak publicly about Max, my mom and my story. Um, meaning for me came through advocacy. It gave me something to, um, to focus on what I was going to impact. And if I could keep talking about it and if I could keep sharing my story and if I could keep doing it professionally, if I could, if I could share that story, not, as a, not just as a sister, but also as a treatment provider. Every time I talked to somebody in state government, we'd have an agenda. And at the end of the agenda, I'd say, could I have two more minutes of your time? My brother died of an addiction and we don't provide, we, we don't cover in Michigan's Medicaid seeing a provider for a person who has an alcohol use disorder, it's not a covered benefit. And people go, yes, it is. I'm like, no, seeing a prescriber is not a covered benefit. It's not through the, the, our, our behavioral health carve out. It's not through the you know, managed care. It, it, we're a Medicaid expansion state, but it's just, it's not, a, there's nobody to bill for it. And every time I spoke to a colleague, a friend, anyone who would listen, I would say, we got we to fix this. We got to fix this. We got to fix this. Um, I saw doors close. I, I had people tell me there's no way to do it. It's, it's been discussed before. Um, and and I, I, um, my daughter is named Eleanor Rose and I named her after um, Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, and so, you know, I, I use a lot of, I, I would look at my daughter and I'd remind myself that she deserved a better place. She had her old, she and her older brother deserved a world or at least to grow up in a state where their uncle didn't have to die. Where there was hope for the where there was hope for the future, so it gave me the strength to soldier on. I would keep talking about it and never giving up. So for the next seven years, I endured. I never stopped talking about Max and the need to change Michigan's Medicaid coverage. So I call it my seven years war. So the seven years war was from 1756 to 1763, and it was a global conflict, a search for global primacy between Britain and France. Essentially, it was a war of territories. And, I, and, and this was a war of territories in Michigan. The um, behavioral health carve out wanted to own substance use disorder, but didn't want to pay for the physicians. The HMOs didn't want to own behavioral health and substance use disorder because it was another cost for them to have. So they said it was, so they did, so everybody was fighting over whose responsibility of it. In Michigan, our behavioral health carve out cre created this siloed structure where mental health counseling and methadone were separated from the rest of a person's health, uh, but neither the mental health carve out or the Medicaid HMOs were responsible for paying for treatment that involved prescription medication or seeing a prescriber. In 2014, they opened limited services around opioid use disorder and this expanded coverage uh, went into effect August 2nd, 2021. So it just went into effect. I'm actually working with um, folks, over at, uh, folks over at the Opioid Response Network to help get uh, this message out to providers. 
Um, I can't tell you the number of times I've heard it's not a covered benefit. We can't do it. It's not reimbursed. Um, and I get it. I get it. We can't give away care for free. But as we've talked about today, there are so many ways that treating addiction reduces health care costs. You saw the return on investment for a recovery, for a recovery code. You, um, we know that there, there's evidence that came out of Kaiser Permanente that shows for every $1 spent treating addiction, the health care system saves four in just in general. Um, but, but we didn't see this. And in my journey of, ad, um, of advocacy, I came across so many people and, and Andy, re, uh, Andy has referred to me as, as, as the Yoda of addiction medicine um, in Michigan because it's like all past um, medication for addiction treatment kind of come back to me because I, I don't stop talking about the importance of, of covering this and now providing it and empowering our prescribers and our providers to treat persons with a substance use disorder because no family, no family needs to suffer and live every day wondering if things could have been different for their loved one if they'd only had access to FDA approved medications to treat a substance use disorder. And I will live with that for the rest of my life. Um, thank you. Our, um, thank you. I, I'm almost done, I promise. In our society, when we look at people, we judge them. Um, can anyone, well, I usually have an audience response, but we won't do that. Um, so this is Stalin, FDR. I have a love affair with the Roosevelt's um, and Winston Churchill. And when I look at this picture, um, these are people who were larger than life. This image shows Stalin on the left. FDR in the middle and Winston Churchill on the right during a summit in the midst of uh, World War II. Um, let's look at their body language. Churchill's kind of slumped down, looking kind of gruff and disgruntled. He was not feeling very well during the summit. It was, um, it was, in, it was in Africa. Um, and Stalin is, Stalin is kind of sitting erect with a ramrod straight back. And FDR almost didn't make it to this picture. He almost couldn't walk to get to this picture. Yet somehow of these three people, he seems the calmest and most relaxed. Why did FDR almost miss this? He had polio. He wore braces and would physically tire easily. And so after a long, long summit, he was exhausted. He wore braces. Um, he, so he wore these braces and you'll see many pictures of him. He's either holding on to somebody, holding on to a podium, holding on to a railing in his car, um, the, sitting behind his desk in the Oval Office, um, often linking arms with Eleanor Roosevelt. Yet despite this, he became president of, of the United States. And if we can learn to use our challenges to make the world a better place, have we not helped? Could we in our position as healthcare providers and sort of gatekeepers help give people the gift of hope that they can learn to lead their lives with the disease of addiction rather than letting their disease lead their life? If I've learned anything through my advocacy, it's this. Persevere, keep talking, never stop, and you will survive. Do it for your family, your community, and those that we treat as a healthcare system. Thank you so much for your time. I dedicate all of my talks to all the people who have lost their lives to addiction and those that try to prevent further losses. Thank you so much for letting me talk about my story today and being so kind. And I hope that it gives you some drive to 